Okay, uh, thanks everyone for joining. Um, before we get started, uh, I would like to uh, firstly uh, acknowledge the traditional lands upon which I am uh, joining you today. So I'm in uh, the centre of Nam, Melbourne in the CBD. Uh, so I'm joining you from the lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. Um, so I would like to pay my respects to um, elders past and present, uh, and also to any Indigenous people that are here today. Um, and I would also like to, in addition to that, uh, just acknowledge uh, the, um, the uh, context that we're in at the moment, um, and also acknowledge um, that in particular, there is a, a large focus on um, the violence that women in particular are experiencing in society at the moment, and just acknowledge that, that is a situation that's happening and something that's really important to be aware of and um, conscious of. And I just would like to acknowledge that and you know not pretend that that's not happening um, at this moment too. Um, so thank you everyone for joining. Um, so my name is uh, Matt Healy uh, and I'm your host today on behalf of the uh, Design and Evaluation Special Interest Group. Um, uh, we've got a fairly, what I think is unique offering today um, you are welcome to introduce yourself uh, and the lands upon which you are joining us from in the chat window. Um, but without much further ado, I'm going to get into things. Um, so as you've noticed, uh, the session is being recorded. So this is both for your benefit for later on, in case you forget everything that we say, um, but also for the benefit of those that are unable to join. Um, and we'll get into a few reasons as to why that is um, in a little bit. But before we uh, get any... Uh, uh, any further behind with my slides because I realized I should have continued on. Um, I'm just going to quickly jump to this slide on the agenda. So what we're going to cover. So this is a, uh, like I said, fairly unique session. So this is being hosted by uh, the Design Evaluation Special Interest Group, um, which I'll speak about in a little bit. Um, I also want to specifically talk you through what this thing is that we've actually constructed. Um, we've then got uh, what is potentially the thing that you're all here for, which is a bit of uh, free professional development slash learning um, that will be hosted by uh, the excellent Christian, who I'll introduce you to in a minute. Um, then I'll get into a few next steps about how we actually get involved in the lab, what it all kind of looks like. Uh, and then, of course, any time for question, uh, questions as well. Uh, so what is the design evaluation SIG? So uh, in simple terms, um, the SIG was established in uh, 2017, um, and that was at a stage in time when uh, this thing known as design thinking uh, was kind of reaching prominence, particularly in the public sector. Uh, and as is often the way when things appear in the public sector context, particularly in government, they inevitably find their way into evaluations because they're in the things that we get commissioned to evaluate. Uh, and so there was a lot of interest in what this thing was and how it's actually different or not different. Um, things like human-centered design, co-design, all the forms of design were kind of being thrown around everywhere. Uh, and so a group of people at that stage decided we should probably create a bit of a space to talk about what this actually means. Um, you know, some people kind of thinking, well, you know, I co-design evaluations. What does that mean? Some people talking about evaluating design. Uh, and so we really want to make sure that we had a space where we could actually, uh, you know, at least from my own perspective, profess to be a bit of an idiot about this stuff or a bit, a bit simple uh, in my understanding. And so, you know, wanting to say, well, like, let's just talk about this and try to unpack what this intersection kind of looks like. So our kind of formal explanation is that we basically create a space to explore this intersection between the design space or the design world and the evaluation world um, and you know the systems uh, as we can call them um, that they both seek to influence. So a lot of designers that you speak to talk about wanting to achieve systems change and working with communities, but so do evaluators. So we've got very similar interests or aspirations, but we come at it from very different perspectives. So, you know, what is what happens when those two worlds collide is what we're kind of here to talk about. Um, I should also clarify that sort of language that we settled on when we talk about what design actually looks like uh, is this phrase here at the bottom. So we're not talking about a particular company's definition or a particular framework. We're talking at a higher level about this kind of process, this intentional process to achieving some form of positive change. That's the aspiration. Um, and the key thing that makes it a design thing is that it's a intentional, systematic, considered process. So we're not just diving in and doing stuff. Um, you know, we're we're following a considered way uh, of making progress or making change. Christian will kind of speak to all of that in a minute, so I'm not going to take his uh, thunder. But that's what we're talking about: is broadly those two 
those two areas and where they overlap. Um, our sort of conceptualization of that in practice of what that looked like uh, was these four things. So when we're talking about that intersection, so that overlap, um, that translates essentially to evaluators acting as designers. So an evaluator like self takes on a design function. So that's that role of creating positive change through an intentional process. Um, you know, again, these are conceptual. You could argue around specifics, doesn't really matter. Um, but, you know, at a high level, that's what we're talking about in one vein, which is, you know, basically you get seconded to do something that's more design focused than evaluation focused. Uh, evaluators as collaborators. So there is a design team. Uh, you are a part of that team. Maybe the simplest way to think about it is uh, um, in the context of, say, developmental evaluation. Um, so, you know, you are a part of a design team who is doing that stuff, but you are holding a evaluation role or function. Um, the third kind of part is evaluators are evaluating the design process. So this would be in a sort of more traditional vein, which would be, you know, someone has run a co-design process. You are evaluating how well that co-design process went. Um, and then the fourth kind of example of that intersection or our interpretation of that intersect intersection is that an evaluator like myself might use design techniques to create evaluation products. So you might use a co-design process to create a logic model or a theory of change. So you are applying that considered intentional process to produce some form of collaboratively owned or collectively owned product at the end. So again, four different interpretations. They are interpretations. I would not hang my hats on them necessarily, but it gives you a broad sense of what we kind of talk about or what we talk around um, in this space. Um, some background. So in recent years, uh, like I said, the SIG started in 2017. Um, and in those earlier stages, we were fairly traditional in our approaches to what the SIG did. So we ran you know, one-off kind of events where we spoke about some stuff, uh, fairly, fairly vanilla, fairly traditional. Um, particularly during COVID years, we kind of pivoted our thinking a little bit to, you know, wanting to have what we effectively called learning sprints. Um, so these were sort of thematically oriented uh, sessions that were sort of basically held within a week, you know, one hour, uh, day after day type sessions. We had a few different models where we had morning and afternoon sessions and whatever else. Um, the common thread throughout all of that is that whilst they were valuable, they largely centered on talk. So we spoke about these things. We talked about them. We discussed them. Um, that has its value. But this year we wanted to, again, in the spirit of being designers uh, ourselves and wanting to maybe, you know, constantly think about how we can keep things fresh and a bit different um, and also be of value to the wider evaluation sector. Um, we wanted to, you know, maybe walk a bit more. So not just talking about this stuff, we want to actually get a bit more hands-on. Um, and so with that, we've brought ourselves to this thing called uh, the Evaluation Lab. Um, this is not my imagery by any means. This is from Canva. I cannot use graphic design platforms, um, but a good example of an evaluator using design perhaps. Um, so what we're talking about when we talk about this evaluation lab is again, a very specific thing. Um, it is based on the idea of sort of innovation labs or living labs. So they are things that are specific spaces or entities that are used to explore things, challenges, problems through some form of, again, design-based process. This specific model that we're using is, uh, it's gonna sound so jargonistic, but it's a team-based open innovation model what that basically means is that you will work in teams um, and uh, the open innovation process is that basically it's open book. So we are not doing things behind closed doors. Um, there is no uh, aim here to create things that will become, you know, sellable products. This is very much for the betterment and uh, benefit of the evaluation sector. Um, and it is again, all coming back to this idea of shared learning. So whilst I will be framing some of this as a bit of a competitive thing, um, we are going to be very open about the process and the journey um, and, you know, have a bit of fun all at the same time. Now, the unique thing with this particular model that we're using is that we are focusing on evaluation challenges. So when I say evaluation challenges, what I mean is specific sort of areas or like categories um, of evaluation work where we face issues, problems, challenges, needs. We are not talking about challenges that those we work with face. Um, we are talking about the things that we in our evaluation practice or our, our evaluation lives face. Um, 
in practical terms, and I'll get into this in a little bit after Christian runs us through uh, his sort of introductory spiel, um, it will basically involve three one-hour sessions um, where we're going to sort of take you through each of these core stages of the design process. Uh, and then at the very end, there's going to be a sort of pitch style event. Um, so I guess when I say that this is a bit different to what the SIGs traditionally run, it is in the sense that it's not just talking. It is very much a hands-on exercise that you kind of sign up for. Um, there is also no cost involved. This is entirely voluntary run um, by the SIG. So there is no financial cost to you. The only thing that's required is your time. Um, and again, I'll speak to the practicalities, but we've tried to remove as many barriers to participation as possible, um, which we'll get into a little bit. Um, but the hint here is that this session is being recorded for those that have registered but can't attend. It's in that sort of vein. So um, the core thing really is that it's team-based. That's probably where the main bit of extra effort is going to be for yourselves. But before we get any further, I want to speak to you a little briefly or quickly, I should say, briefly about a little bit about um, the sort of challenge areas that have been identified. So I did some very non-systematic scoping uh, via some non-systematic avenues. Uh, and essentially I just chatted to a whole bunch of people and asked people for their opinions. Um, and we came up with three kinds of broad categories um, uh, for challenges or, or things that we want to focus on. The bolded parts are kind of the areas, the dot points underneath those are just examples. Um, but these challenge areas that we've identified are effectively evaluation methods, evaluation cultures, and evaluation careers. So the challenge that you and your design team will tackle will kind of fit under one of these thematic areas. Um, but as Christian will take us through in a moment, there are a few steps to go through to even settle on what the problem is that we want to focus on. But to give you a broad brushstroke sense of what we might be thinking about, you know, a common thing in my practice is that when we think about methods, uh, surveys are a very common methodological process that we follow. Uh, and, you know, a perennial challenge is low survey response rates. Um, you know, we throw incentives at them of various sorts. You know, maybe it helps, maybe it doesn't. Um, but, you know, that is a challenge. There are probably other challenges um, that we might want to explore. And again, there are ways that we think about how to frame what these challenges are, um, which Christian will take us through. But that's just to give you a sense of the sort of thing that I'm talking about. So it's a thing that I face in my practice or my peers do in their practice or that we face in evaluation. Um, evaluation culture, as an example. So, you know, one element might be how do those that don't have access to evaluators or resourcing uh, think about or approach evaluation? So small not-for-profits that have, you know, pretty much all volunteers or very limited resourcing. You know, they might think we can't do evaluation because we don't have the resourcing in-house um, to, you know, make that someone's substantive role or to hire a consultant. You know, what what could be thought about in that vein as a solution? Um, similarly, you might think about, say, attitudes to evaluation. So organizations that just don't really have a culture of evaluation. Um, you might think of um, the political elements of evaluation. So how does evaluation uh, get talked about or used in um, political arenas? Um, you know, lots of things you could think about there. Uh, and the last one, which is probably one of my favorite areas to think about um, in terms of sort of needs for this sort of work is in the context of evaluation careers. And the one that I've kind of called out specifically, which is again, one that I'm very passionate about uh, is effectively the idea of sort of confidence for emerging evaluators or, you know, imposter syndrome in that sort of vein. So people that are working in evaluation, but maybe early in their career, you know, how do they grapple with this with this um, idea that they're not an expert in this thing that, you know, often people treat you like you need to be an expert in evaluation to be considered an evaluator. How do you deal with that tension? Um, so like I said, those are the kind of three broad areas and those are just examples of the challenges um, or sort of question areas that we might be thinking about. Um, but I'm actually going to hand it over to Christian now at this point um, to dive into his uh, session. So he's actually got about 45 minutes um, uh, to run us through effectively what is the design process? What does it look like? This is to give you a bit of a sense of what you're going to run through um, should you choose to sign up for, for the Evaluation Lab. Um, so Christian, I'll uh, hand it over to you. Okay, great. Thank you, Matt. And I guess it's good afternoon for most people, depending on where you are. I don't know all of your time zones. And probably just to clarify before I get into my presentation, um, this is 
this is going to be a high level overview of the process. You don't have to be married to any particular decisions you make today as we run through these activities. So the challenge areas that Matt's introduced is the place we're going to start, but that doesn't mean if you do go on it to join the lab that you have to stick to that as well. So just enjoy the process, uh, get a uh, get a, an experience of it, and um, then decide where you want to go from there. Um, just to introduce as well, I did this in the chat window, but I uh, would like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land that I'm on, a beautiful part of Australia, the southern, uh, what you know is the southern end of the Gold Coast, northern New South Wales. This is the land of the Yugam Bear and Bundjalung language groups, nine different language groups that have coexisted for tens of thousands of years with cultural differences and commonalities, um, but have maintained that identity through dialogue, through sharing of resources. I draw a lot of uh, hope and strength from our um, traditional cultures in Australia and, and the oldest uh, cultures in the world that we can learn from these lessons in the way that we work together and live together in the future. So I pay my respect to elders past, present and emerging and acknowledge the sovereignty of Australia's First Nations people has never been ceded. Um, I run a company called White Light Education. Matt and I cross paths maybe around that 2015, 16, 17 point, I don't remember, Matt, where Matt did an introduction to co-design with me. And as he it sort of explained the context to why evaluation and design are crossing over, he had a need to uh, equip himself with a bit more knowledge on design. At the same time, I've had a need to equip myself with more knowledge around evaluation as our co-design work required greater accountability and transparency. So it's been a mutually beneficial um uh, professional friendship that we've grown over the last how many years, Matt? I don't know. Um, so let's get down to business. The reason that we're here for this 45-minute uh, session is to experience a taste of the basic principles, process, and tools of design thinking applied to these broad challenge areas. Maybe I'll just do a quick um, survey. If you could give me a show of hands virtually or real, um, if you have come across the term design thinking before. Yes. Great. Uh, give me a show of hands if you think you are very confident in your understanding of design thinking. No, not me. <laughs> not even me. Okay, great. One thing I do say, uh, um, my company runs a combination of training and consulting. So I do a lot of teaching. I teach for RMIT online as well. And one of my favorite sayings as you're approaching a learning experience, as you probably all will, will have embodied this at some point, is that knowing is the enemy of learning. So if we're in a state that we know, we have a fixed mindset, we're not open. So no doubt some of this will sound familiar. Um, and also if you can keep an open mind, you will learn something in the process as well. So the, pro the, the process we're going to go through, it's a very quick, um, as I said, taste of the design thinking methodology that I teach and, and practice. I'll give a bit of framing around design thinking, how this fits in, uh, into the greater context that we work in historically as well, and then explain this three-phase process that, that I, um, I lead, inquire, ideate, and implement, and why it's a very useful design thinking methodology for anybody who's new to design or isn't trained as a designer, for example. One thing to really you know, disclaimer, let's say, um, you won't leave this session uh, with a Bachelor of Design Thinking. Uh, you won't be an expert. You will have a taste of the process that I hope sparks uh, an interest to continue. And also um, the key thing here is grasping some of the key principles because there's that saying that you can teach somebody to fish, but if you, um, or give somebody a, a fish, but if you can teach somebody to fish, then those principles will give you greater value. So pay attention to those principles as I'm sharing them as well. Okay, let me give you a brief history of design thinking. So um, Joe Suspenska, if you're watching or anybody knows Joe, has done this great summary of the origins and um, subsets of design, which is an, is an imperfect history, but I, I really appreciate it as a visual because I'm actually trained as an architect. I practice as an architect to 2010. And you'll see um, the kind of industrial design movement, product design, um, some of the key figures, but Scandinavian cooperative design way back here as well, started to practice the principles of design that I value, which is participatory design, the democratizing of design where we 
take design out of the world of the um, capital D designers and put it in the hands of end users and stakeholders as well. So this is kind of where I joined the design trajectory in 2010. I took a sabbatical from my, um, what would you say, boring corporate job. And I found myself in Madrid in Spain doing a residency at Media Lab Prado using design thinking to solve a social problem for a local community group. And that was a huge aha moment for me because I saw that the, the creative tools that I'd learned as an architect could be translated out of that um, capital A architecture world into the hands of um, end users to have a more positive social impact. So just to grasp, you know, in its most simple form, what Matt was talking about earlier of, about being strategic and we say, you know, design is a deliberate method for prop creative problem solving. So I think a lot of the work that I've seen people talk about a design process, but there isn't a deliberate and, and um, I guess, structured process that uh, can be measured and evaluated. And this is what design thinking can bring to your work. So moving from that traditional understanding of design as a noun, the physical objects and products, to design as a verb, a process, a methodology. And that's really where I've taken my work in the last, uh, I feel old now, 14 years uh, as a design doer. And again, a, a really simple definition that one of the pioneers of design thinking audio um, have given is design thinking is the process of design applied to anything. This gives you a lot of scope in the work that you're doing. Um, what I love about teaching design thinking is I teach it to school kids, uh, use it in coaching, use it in my own holiday planning with my wife and kids. It's so broadly applicable. And also I'll show you how uh, we can use it to um, be deliberate in the, in the projects that we're running. I assume many of you are looking at social impact as well. Now to, to tell a little story about the, the methodology that um, we teach, inquire, ideate and implement as a process. In 2012, I was leading a space called the Asia Pacific Design Library that was uh, an arm of the State Library of Queensland. We were given an opportunity to conduct research to analyze um, the various design met methodologies that were present at the time and develop a method that could be taught to non-designers, particularly school teachers, uh, to enhance learning. And so we analyzed all of these different methods and found a common set of principles uh, across each phase that we then uh, packaged into these three phases, inquire, ideate, implement. As Einstein says, as simple as possible, but no simpler. So that was really our intention that you don't need to be an expert. You don't need to be a trained designer. You can pick this up in 45 minutes and use it uh, this afternoon and tomorrow as well. So to give some definition to these phases, we're going to step through these very quickly. I'll, I'll give mostly explanation, but you will be completing some activities. And this is really to kind of spark your curiosity and interest in joining the lab where we can go in more depth and more specifically to the problems you'd like to focus on. The first phase, inquire, is about defining a specific problem within a complex system or, or, or a challenge area in the way that Matt has described those. Then uh, turning that problem into an optimistic opportunity. That becomes a design challenge that we use as our springboard for the ideate phase which is the point where we generate ideas, creative ideas as potential solutions to our design challenge. We then converge on a top idea or top ideas that we progress in the implement phase in an iterative way to test out that solution with uh, those who will live with it, to iteratively improve it and develop it so that it has the desired impact that we've de defined earlier on in the process. That's in a nutshell. We'll do a very small version of that uh, a taste today. We won't get too far into implement today. It's really just going to be framing out our, our um, bold idea. But at least if you grasp these three phases and the, their importance, the different mindsets that we use in each phase and the importance actually of structured reflection. So in design thinking, we talk about fast action and slow reflection. It's action-based research where testing uh, assumptions through uh, field testing and engaging with real people. And then when we have those results, we, we reflect. And that's why impact and evaluation has such a role in the design process because you can qualify your decisions using um, logic frameworks or, or um, theories of change as well. 
One of the key mindsets that you'll come across in the design thinking process is the one of divergent and convergent thinking. So during this process, you're being asked to open your mind to consider a wide range of possibilities and then narrow your thinking to converge on insights that you will action into the next phase. This is actually the, one of the more difficult things that people face in adopting this um, process is dealing with the ambiguity of lots of information and then converging on a, an area to action with the fear of missing something or focusing on the wrong thing as well. So this is a muscle that you need to develop and you develop it through practice. So this is it'll be a good start for anyone who's new to design today. Okay, um, I've prepared a bit of a case study to illustrate the activities that we're going to be stepping through today. And uh, I've drawn on one of the particular challenge areas which is the, um, the area around evaluation methods. Now, Matt and I will get into a bit more of this or a lot more of this in the lab if you do join us. We've run a, a range of different training programs together over the last few years where we've looked at the role of uh, systems thinking as the big picture that we then hone in uh, on specific problems for a design process, usually a co-design process, for the work that we do, and then the role of impact uh, monitoring and evaluation and all of that. So you could think of um, evaluation culture as a complex system. I won't get into too much detail with that, other than to know that uh, by putting a boundary around this system or this context, it gives you some clarity to start uh, your area of focus. And this is for design thinking, this is actually an area that has been widely overlooked in recent years. So having that big picture approach to a system before honing in on, on a problem makes a huge difference in, in the methodology. So that's partly what we're going to start with today is where, let's say we're looking at evaluation methods, the practice of evaluating and gathering uh, information to make decisions. And we're going to hone in on specific problems. Now, of course, um, the three case study areas that, that Matt mentioned, so evaluation methods, evaluation, what was the other, career? Evaluation cultures and evaluation careers. Okay. So you can choose something in any of those three areas or something different related to your, your own work today. Uh, find something that you're really passionate about or is, is pertinent to you. Um, we're going to hone in on specific problems, and I'll give you an example for the first part of this activity for the one that I'm going to use. But one thing to say, once we do you know, hone in on these specific problems within a system, a really useful framework, if you haven't come across this before, to help diagnose those problems is called the Kinefin Framework, developed by David Snowden. And this gives a little caveat for design thinking because it's not a silver bullet for every problem that exists in the history of the world. Design thinking is use, really useful for the complex and chaotic problems. In this framework, you can actually uh, analyze problems and find that certain problems are simple. In other words, they have an obvious cause and effect and, and immediate uh, right or wrong answer. Some problems are complicated, which means they do have a, uh, a, a real cause and effect that's not immediately obvious. Uh, there, are, there are examples of best practice where this problem has been solved, and it's usually in the domain of experts outside of your area of knowledge. So both simple and complicated problems uh, are, are a good place to start to make sure that the area that you're looking at hasn't been solved elsewhere by somebody else and that you can solve it more quickly and efficiently uh, without needing to go through a rigorous design process. So keep that in mind with your problems because the complex realm is essentially where the variables are constantly changing. There's no right or wrong answer. And the chaotic problems are the types of problems where massive disruption uh, to business as usual has happened. There is a need to maintain order and then a parallel opportunity for innovation as well. So there's examples that we could go into that in, in the lab as well, but just a starting point to, to think about the kind of problem that you tackle with a design process. Okay. Of course, I'll keep an eye on the chat window as well. If you do have any questions, um, yes, thank you, Matt. Post them in here. Matt, Matt might get my attention if there's a few as well, and there's a good time to pause to address, but I will keep an eye on the chat window as well. So let's step into the first phase. This is called inquire. 
And this is, as I said, about defining problems and identifying opportunities. Talking about a mindset for this phase, I want you to imagine that you're putting on the hat of a paleontologist. So this is essentially, I'm going to use as a metaphor for getting to the the core or getting to the, the bones of an issue or a problem, going beyond the surface, going on beyond surface assumptions to the deeper human need of a problem. That's really the sweet spot in the inquire phase that we're, we're qualifying biases, assumptions, um, hypotheses to get to the deeper human need of a problem. Okay. The first tool I will teach you um, as a starting point is called what's not working for whom. This is a way to frame a specific problem with a focus on your target audience or end user. And we use language and design thinking as a convergence tool. It's very helpful. So you'll see how we, we frame um, some of these activities using language. We put constraints around the responses to those. It's very helpful to constrain our, uh, our thinking so we stay targeted and focused. So I'm going to invite everybody just to draw on your own existing knowledge of the three challenge areas that Matt has shared in the chat window and earlier. And of course, uh, nothing ventured, nothing gained with today's exercises. So really just take something that is pertinent to you at the moment that you'd like to unpack a little bit in the next uh, half an hour or so. And we want you to use that question, what's not working for whom, to identify one wicked problem or complex problem that you would like to explore. I'm going to give you an example of how you can do this as well. And capture that problem, uh, responding to that question in 25 words or less. So here's one I prepared earlier. Uh, in response to the, the, the low response to surveys, let's say our home is community members. You can be even more specific with your, your target audience, your end users. And I've said community members find survey requests burden, burdensome due to lack of relevance and personal time constraints resulting in low response rates. You can, you can have a, uh, a, a negative impact if you like, or you can leave that out, but just targeting what you believe is not working for your community members. I've made a, a hypothesis here, a hunch, that there is a lack of relevance in our survey requests. It's not, not uh, meeting the needs of our community members. Okay, so I'll give everyone just three-ish minutes to reflect on that question, what's not working for whom? Post your problem statement in the chat window. We'll have a quick reflection. Perhaps I can give a little constructive feedback as well. And I'll leave that example up on the screen so that you can... Uh, draw on that. And of course, any questions at this point, go ahead. Thing to say while you are developing your problem statement, this might not seem very academic to you, what we're doing right now. With any design process, we actually start with a hunch, a problem hunch. So that is your own lived experience of the problem area and a hypothesis for not work, what's not working. And then we qualify that hunch through qualitative and quantitative research or ethnographic research where we go out and do desktop analysis or around uh, existing statistics and data that's available but we also use uh, interviewing techniques observation techniques to understand the lived experience from a qualitative perspective so we're not doing that today we're only doing the hunch and even with the hunch you'll be surprised the the level of insight you can get as well okay great let's have a look well done kate NGOs are tasked with serving disadvantaged and vulnerable people, but have little funding to evaluate innovative approaches. That's great. So the what's not working is a lack of funding to evaluate innovative approaches for whom your NGO clients, I'm guessing. Brilliant. Uh, Donna has said services collect lots of data, but don't have the expertise, resources, and strategic priorities to an effectively analyze and make the best use of the data. Brilliant. So uh, the whom are services, you, uh, obviously you could be more specific on that, and uh, the, the lack of expertise to analyze the data that they're gathering. Janet has says staff find evaluation cumbersome because they don't see value in doing it and have no time to do it. I like that. <laughs> That's really a matter of, of, a fact, of fact there, Janet. Fantastic. 
Carolyn said, clients are reluctant to engage in the research due to perceptions of surveillance by a government agency resulting in a small bias sample. Oh, that's a good one. One thing to notice too, I think with these problem statements, uh, um, when you re remember my analogy of a paleontologist, I'm going to talk in a second about the deep human need. So once you get to some of that emotion uh, that the, your client has experienced, you touch on that emotion, you, you know you're on the right track about getting to the, the deeper human need. Yeah, that's great, Carolyn. Uh, Christine has said, executive leaders lose interest in agency strat plans because as soon as the plans are written, <laughs> there's a restructure and it's out of date, resulting in a use use of any evaluation tool being rejected. Okay, that's pretty complex, Christine, but I, I get the gist of it. Family and uh, sexual violence practitioners find survey requests unnecessary and unhelpful burden on their clients, resulting in a lack of evidence about what works for whom and in what context. That's great, Molly. And my my intuition says, why do they find that uh, unnecessary and unhelpful, which is going to be a great segue to the next thing I'm going to introduce, actually. So don't worry about answering that question. Okay. And Federico, I might just read a couple more. You can scan through these. These are great, actually. This in itself is a great snapshot for you, Matt, in terms of um, maybe refining the challenge areas or looking at uh, co-creating the, the focus for the lab even more. So the outcomes we are measuring are not occurring in a vacuum and contribution from other things cannot always be measured. This means that impact evaluation is not working for our client as we can't identify the specific program's contribution. Yes. So the the um, the outcomes and wider goals, I guess, Federico, very good. All right, well done, everybody. It, um, you know, in the work that Matt and I have done together as well, I find that those from an evaluation background grasp these concepts really well. So it's obvious here that you all have a good sense of what we're talking about here. Great stuff. And Matt, any other standouts that I've missed that you'd like to just draw attention to? No, they're all really good actually good good. Um, yeah. good yeah simplicity and and succinctness is the key here and um i'll explain that more as we go into the other activities because it keeps your brain and your mind focused on the main thing the convergence as aspect you imagine you know the divergent thinking you have done to get to this hunch right now is your own lived experience as a practitioner up until this point so you've just gone through your own little convergence process to hone in on a specific problem now one of the things um pardon me, that I was saying about getting to the deeper human need is that um, we can often in a, in a non-deliberate design process, let's say, or a non-deliberate process, I've seen this happen a lot um, in the different contexts that I've worked where we overlook the, the problem space. We, we are very excited to get into solutions. We assume that we know what the problem is without qualifying our hunches and we rush into creating um, exciting and, and shiny solutions that are great solutions for the wrong problem. So we talk about in this inquire phase, sitting in the problem for a period of time. That means immersing ourselves in some of the deficits and, and the negative parts of the lived experience so that we can deeply empathize and then have compassion for that lived experience to address those needs uh, directly and the, and the real human needs. And you know, we all know Maslow's hierarchy of needs. At least what we're trying to understand here is that we're going up beyond those surface needs of, um, you know, feeling, uh, I guess, reward or recognition to, to really the, the need to belong, to feel a sense of accomplishment, to actually fulfill one's potential, right? That's where the kind of deeper level that we're trying to go to with this. And one of the techniques that we can use, it's not isolated to design thinking, but it's very helpful at this point in the inquire phase to interrogate our problem statement to get to a deeper level of human need is a technique called the five whys. Uh, I'll pause that for a second. Who's come across five whys? whys? Anyone heard of five whys? Yes. Anybody got a, a four-year-old or had a three-year-old last week, a four-year-old now who asks five, five whys to every uh, instruction you give. <laughs> so I theoretically understood five whys and now I have a, a real lived experience of five whys. If you have kids, you, you definitely know what that feels like, right? It's very, very useful because uh, it's curiosity, right? So our children 
uh, the great teachers of curiosity. They they want to have a deep understanding of what's at, at play at the core of an issue. So I'll run this five whys technique uh, as an example for you, just to understand this. You don't have to do this activity now, but just think in your mind, if you can, on your problem statement, how you could take that to a deeper level of human need. And um, the kind of one that just stood out from a, from a broad glance at all of your ones in the chat window there was the fear of being um, your data being used incorrectly at, uh, you know, from a surveillance perspective, if you do contribute to a survey. So that fear, you know, is a, is a powerful uh, human need or a powerful driver. Okay, so starting with my problem statement, community members find survey requests burdensome due to a lack of relevance and personal time constraints resulting in low survey responses. So why do they view these requests as irrelevant? Maybe because they perceive them as not addressing their specific needs. Why do they perceive them not uh, addressing their specific needs? Because the questions are often generic, unrelated to their role, industry, challenges, priorities. Why do the questions appear generic? Because they're designed without a deep understanding of the diverse and nuanced needs of community members. Why are they designed without that deep understanding? Because there's insufficient engagement. Why? We don't know. Um, with the target audience during the survey design process. Why? Uh, because survey designers may not have access to or prioritize direct interaction with community members. Lots of assumptions here. That doesn't matter. That's, that's really, as I said, this is uh, framing a hunch from a deeper level and going out through that action research to qualify that hunch or, or hypothesis. So from this, I've got a, a little sense that maybe the deeper human need is for meaningful engagement and understanding between us as survey designers and community members that resonate with their, their diverse and nuanced needs. Great, I'll just check the chat window. Uh, <laughs> great, Katarina. Okay, so with that in mind, we're, we're honing in on the deep human need we started with the deficit space. What's not working for whom? The pain point or the deeper human need. It's a problem. It's a negative. This is really helpful for framing the current state of, of what's not working currently and historically to this point. But it's almost that negativity uh, mindset is kryptonite to creativity and innovation. So we have to do something at this point to frame our mind to be optimistic and thinking toward the future. And that technique that we use at this point is called a how might we question. Uh, to reference the great Socrates, he says that the secret of change is to focus all of our energy, not on fighting the old, but on building the new. So this is the philosophy of the how might we question. We understand the nuance of the current state of what's not working, but we don't stay there. That's also the risk of empathy. It's something we talk about in design thinking. If we empathize uh, too long and too hard with our target audience, we stay in the space of deficit and negativity. So we do need to spend some time empathizing and deeply understanding that space, but we don't want to stay there. We want to move to a space of compassion where we can see a bigger picture and a possibility and understand a, a way forward. So the how might we question, it's a magical question that's used by design thinkers um, in all different contexts. These three words combined frame our mind to be optimistic uh, and uh, gear our mind to an optimistic future. The word how, that's the most optimistic part of the question. We already believe a solution is possible. The second word might helps us to let go of perfectionism. We don't have to uh, do it one particular way. It's uh, sort of eliciting some experimentation and risk-taking. So instead of how should or how must or how can, we say how might. And then the third word, we, is collaborative. It recognizes that these complex challenges can't be achieved by any single stakeholder alone. So how might we, those magical words combined, gear our mind to an optimistic future where the problem has been resolved or it has been evolved? And this, I'll use a rocket ship analogy that I'll come back to at the end of this session, where the problem is the current state, it's where we are now. The opportunity question is the ideal future that we want to work toward where the existing problem no longer e exists or it has been resolved or evolved as well. And design is the process, the solution. It's the bridge between our current state and our imagined ideal future state. Okay, so I'm going to invite everyone again another three minutes to transform your problem statement into a how might we question. This is something you can practice for years, become an expert in, you're going to do it in three minutes. So just 
uh, have a go at it. Trust the process. Intuitive is great here. Um, Goldilocks theory is not too broad, not too specific. I'll give you an example. We use a formula that says, how might we create an intended experience for our target audience so that we have our desired effect? Now, the, the desired effect is the impact. Very good for program logic um, or having some kind of outcome that you are focusing on to build into your how might we question. And here's an example that I came up with for that design, uh, for that problem into a, an opportunity. How might we design a personalized survey experience for our community members so that their active participation contributes to the greater positive impact in our work? Now you can see not too broad, not too specific. We're not saying how might we create an online survey uh, program that is um, personalized to each person's name and goes out on Tuesday and Thursday at 4 p.m. and 6 p.m. Um, it's actually creating the space for possibility that your ideas can fit within. It's a constraint for the types of ideas that you'll come up with in the next phase. Okay, so I'll give everyone just a couple of minutes, three minutes to brainstorm uh, and generate a how might we question, an optimistic question uh, in response to your problem statement that paints a picture of an ideal future where that problem no longer exists. And again, any questions, pop them in the chat window. Great to see some starting points here. So how might government funders create cascading MEL frameworks for social programs that adequately resource and incentivize grant providers to collect the right data at the right time and share learnings, including impact. Great, great jumping on that, Jemima. A little bit of refinement um, to simplify, but yeah, really, really good start. Carolyn, how might we convince clients that the data they share with us will be kept confidential? What I'd love you to add to that, Carolyn, is the so that, the desired impact so that we have greater uh, or more reliable data to make informed decisions that support the most vulnerable or whatever, whatever it is that you're hoping to focus on. Um, Federico, well, how might we give a program the recognition it deserves for its program deliverers so that its relative value can be understood within this e ecosystem of similar programs? I like that. That's great. And um, when you're sharing, I mean, this is also part of a communication process. Matt's sort of uh, pointed to this about a pitch that's going to happen at the end. Communication and storytelling is a huge part of a design process. I know it is as part of a, an evaluation process as well. You need to tell a story that inspires other people and gives them clarity on the journey that you're going through. So what we've, we've already started to build here is a, is a start of a pitch where you've got a, a problem statement that catches people's attention for a deficit that shouldn't be and then you're moving to an optimistic space where you're inspiring people with the, the opportunity of change. That's really the feeling you should have from going from that problem where all hope is lost to the how might we, wow, there's a future that's possible here. Should feel optimistic. Okay, Molly said, how might we work in partnership with practitioners so that survey design is experienced as relevant, useful, and trauma-informed? Love it. Great. Emma, how might we enhance senior and middle leaders understanding and value of evaluation so that evaluation culture is enhanced across the organization? Good stuff. Janet, how might we create spaces and opportunities for staff so that they understand and adopt evaluative mindsets to enhance effectiveness of our work? Great, great, great. How might we embed ECB in our work with teachers so that they feel connected to it and use it in their everyday work? Awesome stuff, everyone. Um, would spend a lot longer uh, giving more nuanced feedback. One thing I, I will just kind of throw into the mix here is that your how might we question is closer to poetry than it is to prose or academic writing. So in some cases, um, well, the first thing to say is that where possible, you can use more poetic language, adjectives that inspire and excite your subconscious mind. Uh, to say this crudely, after your first go at a how might we question, sprinkle some glitter on it. So find a word to replace, you know, build. How might we tr transform? How might we empower? How might we reimagine? These words are really inspiring. And that's going to be important to gear your mind subconsciously as you step into ideation to think differently. The issue with this, of course, is that you, you reserve that kind of communication for the audiences that understand the process. So if you're going to, 
provide a briefing to a minister on the process you're going through at the moment, you're not going to sprinkle too much glitter on that um, language as well. But this is the purpose that we're using that optimistic and um, poetic language to get our mind in the space for innovation and creative thinking. Okay, great stuff, everyone. Just got an um, um, eye on time and I would like us to get into the next section. So Matt, were there any other how might, good, how might, might we questions that you'd like to share from that group? No, I think uh, we can... everyone's grasped it, the the concept. Yeah. I think so as well. Okay, so now take off your paleontologist hat and put on the hat of a child, a small, playful, curious, excitable child. This is the mindset of the ideate phase. So in this phase, particularly the first part where we're diverging our thinking, we want to be playful, open-minded, where anything is possible. Uh, really open to doing things differently. And that's the importance of the how might question to inspire you to keep your mind open to possibility. And we're going to take that to the next level with this very quick activity. I should say for this activity, we're going to do some quick, very rapid brainstorming in, in about five minutes. So what you will need for this is something to write on very quickly. If you have post-it notes, I know some of you still use and work with post-it notes, get a cluster of those ready with a pen. Otherwise, worst case scenario, you're in a, a word processor or a Google Doc just rapidly typing down ideas. So just make sure you've got that ready while I introduce some of the key principles of ideation. So the first one is the role of deferring judgment temporarily. When we are being creative and uh, doing this, what we call generative thinking, and we really are in tune with that creativity, we're doing it from a different part of our brain. We all know about the prefrontal cortex, its role for critical thinking and rational decision making. Very helpful, keeps us alive, keeps us uh, you know, employed, but not very helpful in the ideation process at the very start. So we need to ask that critical part of our brain to take a little break, say thank you. And we are engaging the limbic part of our brain, which is intuitive and where it's uh, following a stream of consciousness, essentially where anything is possible and generating ideas that are based and building on the ideas of previous uh, ideas, basically. Okay, the second principle that goes along with that generative thinking is that quantity leads to quality. That's the, the belief that we adopt for this process, that through a wide range of uh, ideas as possibilities, we will find high quality ideas and not being concerned on the quality of the ideas while we're generating them, just generating them for, for creativity's sake. And finally, the third principle that we use in ideation, which is very helpful for getting us to think intuitively and in the moment is Parkinson's law. Essentially, I'm going to give you a very short amount of time to generate a lot of ideas. And that's based on the knowledge that work expands and contracts to meet the time available. You will have experienced this phenomena if you've uh, done any study or university uh, accomplishment where you've submitted a assignment, a project, a report, at 4.59 on a Friday afternoon when it's due at five o'clock. For some reason, our subconscious mind is very good at organizing and producing results within the time available. So we, we hack our brain a little bit with that mindset, knowing that we can deliver a short, uh, a lot of ideas in a short amount of time if we are in the moment and using some healthy adrenaline. Okay, so with that in mind, just give me a virtual or real thumbs up if you are ready to brainstorm ideas. Nothing to lose. So your brain, just a reminder, your brainstorming ideas as solutions to your how might we question. How might we? And your answer to the how is an idea. Okay. So I call this the idea challenge. It's a great one for getting people to think differently. You can do this in shorter or longer time frames, but I'm going to give you two minutes for both parts, the two parts of this activity. So the first part of this activity, two minutes to brainstorm 20 bad ideas. These are the kinds of ideas that would get you thrown in jail. So really let your mind go wild. Capture these ideas uh, as a stream of consciousness on a post-it note or anything that you have available. I'm going to set the timer for, for two minutes. Go hard, go fast. Anything that comes to mind, write it down and then we'll reflect later. Your time starts now. Three seconds. So time for another five bad ideas. Take them further. In, in generative thinking, it's about building on the idea that you've previously come up with. So what would be worse than the idea you just wrote down? What would be wilder, more disastrous? 
and you don't necessarily have to share any of these two. So don't filter yourself. You can bring your, your judgment, critical thinking in at the end. Just a little cross to the dark side. Okay, time's up. Well done, everybody. If you do have the desire to let some of the, the darkness out into the light, um, feel free to share one of your bad ideas in the chat window. I do ask you, please do be respectful. So I don't want anybody sharing anything that would be hurtful or, or offensive to anyone, uh, any particular group. But mostly we want to see the ideas that will give us a little, uh, little like sinking feeling. Okay, this is great. Our organization stops doing all work except for evaluation. Give pay rises for every logic model completed. Blow budgets. That might already be an existing idea, Donna. <laughs> Great stuff. Okay. Yes. It's good to get to know your shadow self. You don't have to live there, but uh, only count inputs. Good stuff. All right. I'm sure... There's a lot of fun that we can have with that. I'm going to get onto the next activities because we are short of time. But keeping the, the mindset of anything is possible. You, you kind of opened your mind to think differently. I want you to maintain that. We're going to do the same activity for two minutes for good. Whoops, I'm going to change that to uh, 20 good ideas in two minutes. Anything is possible. Don't filter yourself again. Uh, 20 good ideas in two minutes and your time starts now and time is up. So similarly, if you'd like to share one of your good ideas in the chat window, go ahead and do that. Or what you will have grasped, that's the end of, of that specific activity. What you will have grasped, if you've watched any MasterChef or Lego Masters or any of those sort of um, participatory shows, this is the same approach, Parkinson's Law, where you're put under a certain amount of pressure to to allow your subconscious mind to bring to the surface results, you know, uh, that you're targeting. So it can be very powerful. It's called use stress. It's the positive side of stress um, that is actually healthy and allows the stimulus for growth. It's not, shouldn't be debilitating. It should feel like it's exciting and uh, ener energizing. And that kind of can draw out possibilities and ways of thinking that you haven't heard of uh, or, or come across before. Great stuff. So one of the things, just to reflect on that process, it's very interesting when I've run this hundreds of times, maybe thousands of times with all different uh, cohorts. And in different environments, some people find it easy to come up with bad ideas and some people find it easy to come up with good ideas. What I have found as, as, a, as a general rule is that those who are in uh, highly bureaucratic environments where there's a lot of rules and expectations around ways of being and, and thinking. Um, if I'm uh, given the liberty to think ba about bad ideas, it can be quite liberating. It can uh, actually free up some creativity for those who are uh, used to thinking about good, feasible, rational ideas. With that in mind as well, though, I want you to actually discard the, the binary of bad or good and think about these ideas as being more useful or less useful relative to the context of your how might we question. So bad ideas, you could actually look at those and flip them so that they become good ideas. Or some of your bad ideas are just weird and they can be evolved to become innovative or, or actually um, be more feasible or realistic as well. Now, there's, there's a whole amount of rigor that we go through at this point in the design process. And this is only one tool that we use in ideation um, of many tools. And this is the deliberate part of the design process. We have many techniques to achieve different outcomes and types of ideas. But at this point, we do want to converge our thinking on a particular idea that we would take through into the implement phase. And uh, I'm going to t tell you about a, a concept called the moonshot shortly. Um, but just to touch on a couple of frameworks that we use to evaluate ideas at this point that would probably be consistent with your evaluation techniques. This is a, called an idea implementation matrix where we then take the ideas that we've brainstormed. Um, maybe we've developed them a bit further so they're more specific and they really uh, target the how part of how might we. And then we rank and sort them on this matrix in terms of their impact on the, on the uh, solution or the problem uh, and their ease of effort to implement. Another one is called, uh, and the sweet spot there is obviously but in that easy to medium, high impact, medium impact. The other one is called a DVF analysis, which is 
ranks and sorts ideas in terms of their desirability from your target audience, their feasibility to be executed within your current resources, and their viability financially and sustainably over the course of you know the life of a project as well. However, the one I want to teach you today is called the moonshot. And this is really the, 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 the kind of opportunity for really rapid innovation and, and massive change. This was taught to me by a guy called Dr. Astro Teller, head of Google X at the time when I heard him speak. Google X have this approach uh, that it's easier to make something 10 times better than it is to make something 10% better. And they say that because uh, to be 10% better or to improve something by 10%, you have to uh, be better than everyone who's ever thought that way. Or in other words, you have to improve the existing paradigm uh, that everybody has been following for a long period of time by, by 10%. Very difficult. To be 10 times better, you just have to think differently. So this is paradigm shift ideas, ideas that get you out of your comfort zone and allow you to see the world in a new way. So I'm going to actually um, invite everybody at this point. Um, how am I going for time, Matt? Have I got about another five-ish minutes or so? Yeah, that's it. I got a quarter past. Is that cool? Yeah, yeah, you got it. Great. So uh, I'm going to invite everybody at this point just to think about all of the ideas, the bad and the good ideas that you have brainstormed. And you can choose, I'd like to invite you to choose, while I'm sharing a bit more information here, the idea that excites you the most from that list of ideas. It can be a bad idea or a good idea. And you're going to knock it into shape slightly uh, with a little technique that I'm going to share at the end of this um, this message here. So just keep that in the back of your mind. I want you to find the idea that excites you the most from that uh, little brainstorming session. And you're going to be, be presenting that back to us in the chat window in a second. So get ready to pick or, or scan and pick one idea that excites you as your potential moonshot to your design challenge. All right. So that was the, that, that's a very short version of the ideate phase. At this point, you, you're almost like taking off the ideate hat or keeping that on and putting your inquire hat on as well and having those two hats operating at the same time. Because at this point, we have uh, a hunch for an idea that has potential to have a positive impact on our um, design challenge. We have to go through a creative and a rational process to test, evaluate, iterate, and progress that idea so that it is meeting the needs of our target audience. Here's just that rocket ship analogy again. Um, Iteration is based on user testing. So that is actually testing out our idea early on to avoid a um, catastrophic risk and failure later down the track. So when we don't test out our ideas, and that's uh, done through prototyping, which I'll share in a second, uh, we make assumptions about how our end users will receive those solutions. And often they miss the mark dramatically. And there can be a huge waste of time, money, and resources that could have been prevented. The paradox here is that we need to have a healthy uh, culture that embraces low level risk and failure, that provides for that risk and failure to take place in a safe way that isn't catastrophic so that we do prevent that catastrophic failure later down the track. So it's all about managing risk through micro corrections that happen through testing. Micro tests that are evaluated in a short uh, way that we'll, we'll share more about this in the lab. Uh, to iteratively, iteratively improve our solution as we get closer to that ideal future of our how might we question. Um, the first way we, we test those ideas out is through prototyping. This is a way to test out the idea in objective reality with our end user and use their insights to inform the development of the solution. This is essentially getting an idea out of our head using symbols to create an experience that simulates the solution for our end user so that they can imagine themselves walking through it and we use that observation and um, feedback to inform the next steps that we take in improving that solution. Uh, and this is probably some of the fun stuff, I guess, to tease for the uh, the lab, Matt, about uh, how you'll go through the design process to visualize and test your top ideas. Great stuff. Okay, um, so I'm gonna invite everybody to capture, uh, now choosing your top idea, we want you to capture that idea as an analogy. This is a great way at this point, at the end of ID8, to frame your idea in a way that others will understand. So this technique is very helpful. We call, call it idea as analogy, to, to uh, frame an idea in a specific way that other people can grasp. So you think about my design challenge about improve, improving the survey experience for community members, 
so that it's nuanced, it's personalized. I've come up with an idea of Siri for surveys. It's like a personalized concierge for surveys where you receive tailored invitations and questionnaires that feel like curated recommendations, like a, a trusted personal shopper in a bustling marketplace. There's a sort of reward and value exchange as well. Okay, so I'll give you just, just a couple, I'll give you three minutes, folks, uh, to select your favorite moonshot idea. Give it a bold title and describe how it would work using an analogy. Pop it in the chat window and let's see what kind of innovation has just come out of this 45 minute uh, rapid design thinking taster. I'll, I'll allow everyone to keep sharing. Don't be shy. Um, this is obviously a, a new, um, I guess, approach from many of us. And we've done this in a very short amount of time as well. So Matt, you can be, you can guide us to how much time we have for reflection and Q&A. I'll, I'll obviously stay till the end as well and opportunity to kind of tease for the uh, the lab and how we can dive deeper into some of these principles as well. But thank you, everybody. I really appreciate your openness uh, to trusting the process and uh, trying on some of these new behaviors and activities. I'm really impressed by the little bits of progress that we did in a short amount of time. And hopefully you can see as well the potential for this stuff to happen, um, you know, uh, with more impact, with more time and availability in the lab as well. Awesome. Thanks, Christian. Um, so I'll just get through the rest of these slides. There's only a few left and then we'll have some time at the end if people have any questions or reflections for you. Um, so that was very much a kind of a teaser as to what you'll experience going through the, the lab. So um, just to give you a bit of detail on what the structure of it is going to look like. So um, as I've alluded to, we've kind of got three broad challenge areas um, that are going to kind of help provide that boundary to that that kind of um, area of inquiry that we want to explore. And I guess the, probably the key thing to keep in mind is that what we're basically talking about here is kind of practicing um, the first and fourth uh, sort of interpretations of the interface of design and evaluation. So you will be stepping into a design role. Um, and I noticed in a few people's questions and prompts, um, there was an interesting kind of shift where people kind of sort of said, how might others do things differently? Um, and I think a key thing here that we're talking about is we're not shifting responsibility onto others to do things. What we're trying to do is actually say, well, how would we collectively um, think about this differently? So it's not about saying others need to do better. It's about saying, well, what can we do to address this particular thing? What's that idea? Um, and almost taking responsibility and ownership for that. Um, obviously with a bit of uh, a bit of fun and a bit of uh, a bit of a um, Sort of give it a go attitude to it as well uh, and obviously that very last point you know we are applying design tools and design techniques to kind of an evaluation context as well um so just a bit of uh upfrontness with this so um as i've said this is a bit of a different structure to what we typically do in uh our work so this is an introduction to the evaluation lab uh this is basically the sort of open call for or open discussion or open description i should say of what the lab will look like so what this will translate to is effectively uh, Christian uh, and myself um, will be hosting these one hour sessions. Um, you can see the dates there. And we'll basically do a deep dive in a little bit more detail um, into those three stages um, that we just went through. Uh, the idea here is that essentially um, you will be able to form design teams, I'll call them. So you know yourself and at least one other person, but no more than sort of four other people. Um, and basically you will tackle a question, a problem um, going through this process. And the idea is that at the end of this, uh, there will be some sort of pitch style event. Now, the reason I've said TBC is because I've actually submitted this as a session for the AES conference, which is in September. Uh, and so the idea is that if you are going to the conference and I'm, you know, we'll find out what happens with the session, but if it gets in and you're going to the conference, the idea is that we'll be able to have some of these pitches be live. If you're unable to make the conference, we'll also do like a virtual event and we'll kind of record them as well so that there's no kind of barriers to participation. The other thing is that like this session, we'll record each of these one hour offerings um, so that if you want to participate, but you know, you can't on these dates and, and at these times, you'll still get the benefit of seeing the content explained in deeper detail. Um, so again, no barriers to access. Um, but the main thing that we're doing here and the main ask of you is that if you want to uh, attend these sessions, that you basically give it a go. So we're not asking you to sort of attend and sit in the background. It is very much about getting hands on with this stuff so that you can learn how to do it and understand what the practice actually looks like. 
Um, my back of the envelope estimate from end to end with this whole thing is that it's probably in the range of like handfuls of hours. So this can be as big or as small as you want it to be. Um, this is the benefit of doing it in teams because you can kind of have a bit of a, you know, you know, go off and investigate the problem from different perspectives or divide things up. Um, but there is benefit in doing it together because you can discuss your ideas, you can brainstorm together. Uh, you know, I guess my kind of thinking of this is that if you had one other person from within your office or within your organization, they don't have to be an evaluator, they can be anyone. Um, really what we're trying to do is to say like, you could sit down you know, a couple of hours over the next few months, um, sorry, a couple of hours per round over the next few months, you know, maybe 10 hours, 12 hours total, um, you will get a good taste of what this experience looks like. Um, you will also have a chance throughout to engage with what we've called critical friends, which are some of my colleagues who are helping uh, with the SIG as well, who can basically be these sorts of like, external voices um, that provide feedback or their own perspective. But you can also seek that from others as well. So again, we're not kind of limiting you um, as to what this looks like. Probably the key touch points are these three dates and times. Um, and we've got a supplementary kind of workbook with basically some, you know, templates, quite simple templates to help keep this quite targeted and, and focused. Um, but like I said, this is meant to be a bit of an experiment for us as well. Uh, like, you know, often the AES hosts things that are, let's meet for an hour, chat about stuff, and then you kind of go back. This is meant to be a bit of uh, a bit of a trial at doing something a little bit differently um, that is also free. Like there is no cost access, uh, cost barriers. Um, we'll record everything if you choose to sign up. Um, so really the next steps here, if you are interested is, uh, assemble a team, Avengers style. Um, so, you know, yourself and at least one other person, you know, I wouldn't suggest any more than five of you total because then it gets a bit messy. Um, you know, start to think about those kinds of boundaries that we've talked about. So methods, um, careers, uh, cultures, um, sign up. So I'll show you that in a second. Uh, and then in that first session, we're going to do a deeper dive uh, and recap some of this stuff again. Um, and you'll basically be able to sort of go forth from there, select your how might we questions and start to sort of unpack this um, uh, in a bit more of a supported fashion um, and a bit less rushed or a bit less um, pressed for time. Um, so basically what we'll be doing from here is you'll be sent this recording again. So you can kind of re-watch re it if you so desire. Um, I've also put up a QR code. Um, there'll also be the link there at the bottom. Um, this is basically to like register your team in inverted commas. If you don't know who else is going to be on your team at this stage, it doesn't matter. To be honest, this is largely just about like providing your email so that when the design seek emails you with like the invites for the follow on sessions and things like that, it's got somewhere to go because the AES has your emails, not, um, the SIG. Um, so this is just to like sort of register you for the process. Um, if you're not sure, you don't have to decide right now that you'll get the slides and stuff as well. So, um, it'll all be provided. Um, but like I said, it's fairly light touch, but a little bit more touch than what you've just experienced as well. Um, so we've got sort of five minutes left. So if you've got questions that you want to put to Christian about anything that you just went through, uh, if you've got any questions about the lab itself, um, by all means, um, speak up. But like I said, this, the big thing with this, the big principle is that it's an open process. So all of the sessions are kind of open to all the teams. Um, you know, we're not sort of trying to hide off or, or carve out hidden proprietary experiences for people. Like this is meant to be a sort of open collaborative exercise. So um, the key thing here is that we're all kind of learning together and trying to figure out some of these challenges together as well. So by all means, you can just unmute yourself and ask your questions. That's probably the most efficient um, or otherwise put them in the chat if you uh, don't have a microphone handy or anything like that uh, as well. Just to add to that while you're sharing that, Matt, um, I'll make my slides available to distribute to everybody. And um, most evaluators I've spoken to know about Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial um, IP. So essentially that anything that I've shared with you today, you can use in your own work if you're not making money out of it, which that doesn't really mean work, right? Um, but yes, it's I love I love seeing these uh, resources shared and used for positive impact. Uh, that's what you know, we're, we're all here for. So you feel free to use these with your teams and um, yeah, make the most of what we've covered today. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so just to answer a couple of the questions. So if you want to participate, but you don't know of anyone, um, 
you can still register. Like that's the key thing here. And there's a comments box at the end. So you can just note, you know, I want to do it, but I don't know if I have anyone. Can you help me basically? That's probably the simplest way at this stage. Um, I've just posted the link as well in the chat, if that's easier, if you don't have a smartphone with you to hand. And again, you don't have to decide now. Um, but like I said, it can be anyone. It doesn't have to be an evaluator or a designer. You will be coached through the whole thing. Um, uh, the challenge or problem, uh, Jen, to answer your question, broadly in those thematic areas is what I've suggested, um, but they can be tweaked. Like more than likely they will kind of go way further off from where they start. But that's why I've tried to frame them in terms of like, you know, thematic areas rather than like a problem statement um, because they need to be relevant to your context as well. So, you know, methods, cultures or attitudes, careers, you know, there'll be something in one of those um, that's relevant to you. That'll also support you forming a team as well so that other people who are interested in that particular area can be matched together, but then you'll all get to determine the specific problem that you focus on. Yeah, absolutely. And like I said, you know, this won't be more than, it doesn't have to be more than handfuls of hours, but if you want to spend a lot more on this and it's actually relevant to something you're grappling with in your workplace, as I said, it's kind of an open process, but there's nothing to say that you couldn't, you know, uh, subsume some of the stuff that you're grappling with in your own work into this uh, in some form as well by any means. So, um, Matt, yeah. Jerry, are you, are you saying that if I don't have a team, which I don't, um, yeah. that it could be formed of, part of the people who go to the lab and we could sort of work online or something? Yeah, so basically if you sign up and get invited to the the first one, we'll basically try and do, I don't want to say matchmaking because uh, no, I'm only no, doing it on right. of my desk, but basically if there are people who, you know, if you and someone else are like, I don't have anyone, it'll just be like, how about you two partner up essentially? Yep, yep. yeah, that'd work. Okay, thanks, uh, Matt. Yep. Been no a worries. top session. Thanks, right. I didn't really do anything. Christian did most of the work. So uh, <laughs> well, he, he did a good job too. Thanks. Uh, we've still got a couple of minutes. So if anyone has any design-based questions for Christian or any other questions about the lab, by all means. Um, but uh, yeah, we'll also send around the slides from both Christian's bit and also the slides I've just been sharing uh, as well. Stop sharing now. I have one, uh, it's me again. Um, yes. Kristen, yes. do you have to have some, is, sorry, is there any value in having someone else ask you the why questions? So when oh, you do Absolutely, it, like, yes. Yeah. yeah. And um, one of the things I've done over the years is a kind of uh, corporate coaching called Design Council um, yeah. for, for sort of uh, mid-tier, you know, ex executives uh, to kind of tease out those deeper needs. Five whys is fantastic for that. I'll give you a, a 20, uh, 24 technique, Jerry, um, that you might be interested in is actually you can use generative AI to do this process for you. The results vary, but um, it's uh, I find it a very helpful uh, just generative tool to get me thinking. Yeah. So I've yeah. set up some prompts. I'd be happy to share that in the lab, actually, just so you can see what results yeah. you get. Um, the main thing is you're trying to disrupt your own biases mm -hmm. and assumptions, right? Yeah. So another person can do that. Uh, change as I said shift your body shift your mind uh, going for a walk or going to the gym and forgetting about it and then remembering again is another way to mm. kind of get out of that existing paradigm thanks very great well if, uh, there's nothing else then uh, everyone's free to go uh, of course um, and like I said the slides and everything will be sent around uh, afterwards, uh, along with the link and stuff. So there'll be plenty of time to still register. And there'll be people who registered for today that couldn't attend um, who'll sign up too. But uh, yeah, hope to uh, see some of you uh, in the first session in a couple of weeks' time.